remember what life was like for you when you were nine years old? You were likely going through puberty, and you were more concerned with looking good and avoiding looking bad. For me, the year was 1992. I was entering the fourth grade, and I went to Heflin Elementary School in Houston, Texas. For me, I was more concerned about rushing home to chat my friends up on the phone, which you know was a landline, <laughs> or jumping in front of the tube to watch my favorite music videos on MTV. Or if you were really anything like me, you like to collect a lot of things. I mean like bookmarks, posters, pins of new kids on the block. <laughs> Those were the good old days, right? You were only nine. What did you really have to worry about? You didn't have to worry about paying bills, right? You had to just worry about that really cute guy in class and if he really liked you back. Or failing your math test. There weren't too many worries. Things were a little different for me. When I was nine, my mother worked as a draftsman at the phone company. <laughs> and I can remember every morning she would wake me up to the smell of bacon, eggs, toast, and Folgers coffee. It was the best part of waking up. <laughs> I can remember every night she cooked us a hot meal. And on Wednesday nights, she let me set the menu. Life was good back then. And then things began to change. My mom and I spent less time at home, where she'd go on our little vacations, and I'd spend time at my aunt and uncle's. But it was OK. It was kind of like slumber parties. And then we had to move. We moved from a two-bedroom apartment to a one-bedroom apartment just nearly a mile up from where we lived. I had to sell my Care Bears canopy bed, my Mickey Mouse stove, and my Snoopy snow cone machine. Well, OK, Snoopy had to go because I was getting syrup all over the kitchen, and Mom wasn't having it. Mom was dying. My mother had developed a rare disease that the doctors didn't know what it was. She went from having a great job to being unemployed, single, sick, nearly homeless, and with a nine-year-old to raise. My mother was brave. She was resilient. But that still didn't negate the feeling that I felt when she'd asked me to go to the store to pick up milk, eggs, bread, peanut butter, rice, and beans. In going to the store, when I'd walk into Mr. Vick's place, it smelled like fresh bread and roach spray. As I'd gather groceries into my cart, and I'd wait in line to check out if there were any other patrons in line, I'd ensure that they'd go in front of me because I didn't want them to see me paying with food stamps. I mean, this was in the early 90s, so you had the bright, colorful paper books, right? You didn't have the EBT cards that can be mistaken for debit cards today. I was embarrassed, and I didn't want anyone to know but Mr. Vic knew. Or when my mother would ask me to go to the church pantry with her because she was too weak to bring the food back on her own. She would open her grocery stack, and as she was stacking and piling the food into our bag, I would stand back and survey the room to see who I recognized because I didn't want anyone from church to know that we came here to get our food. I was humiliated. Or even at school in the lunch line, as I had my food, I would cross my fingers that a classmate wouldn't be standing in front of me or behind me because I didn't want them seeing me pass along that little red ticket to the lunch lady. Or from elementary and middle school, and then in high school, it went to that four-digit pen that I'd whisper to the lunch lady. You see, I was afraid that my classmates would judge me and make fun of me to no end because I wasn't like them. We couldn't even afford food. And so there were good days where there were Hamburger Mondays and Cheesy Pizza Fridays that really carried the day because it meant that it was something other than beans. I mean, my mom was a, was a delightful cook, but I really couldn't tell because we had beans almost every night. 
We had black beans, white beans, pinto beans, lima beans, red beans, 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 beans. By the time I graduated from high school, I didn't care if I ever ate a bean another day in my life. I was only nine years old. From the age of nine to the age of 18, I've blocked out that entire period of my life. I made up that I wasn't good enough, I didn't belong, and something wasn't right here. And as a result, I've developed my entire identity based on that. I felt like it wasn't right for me to feel that way as a nine-year-old, that I wasn't good enough and that I didn't fit in. But now as an adult, I realize that there was nothing to be ashamed of. Because there are 24 million Americans that suffer from not having enough food to eat. That's one in seven Americans. And in this city and in Milwaukee, it's one in four where children like me are present. And so I stand before you sharing my story in hopes that my narrative will change the narrative. I now work as an executive for Wisconsin's largest food bank. And I see the many faces of hunger every day through the hundreds of thousands of people that we're able to feed with dignity and compassion. I see that urban hunger is a lot like suburban and rural. The geography may be the same, but the people are a lot alike. Like the case of Nikki, the young girl who steals a little extra from the lunchroom to ensure that her little brother and sister have something to eat at night. Or Margot, the single mother who has to choose between rent and electricity or food on the table for her babies. Or Gary, who has degrees on top of degrees that just so happened to lose his job, and now he's trying to figure out, how am I going to put food on the table? Or Maria, who lives in a senior community, who's on a fixed income, and who's trying to balance her prescriptive drugs and the rising cost of groceries. And finally, Jose. Jose seem seemingly could never really keep a job, but he was able to pick up on and odd and end gigs here and still couldn't scrape up a living wage. It's this narrative that Nikki, Margot, Gary, Maria, and Jose, as if it's their fault that they're hungry, that they're the weaklings of society, and that it's something that they did to put themselves in this situation that keeps us stuck. I mean, but do you even know what I mean when I say hunger, right? You may have fasted for your personal reasons or religious reasons, right? And maybe your mind wasn't right while you're going through the process, so you got really hungry and angry at the same time. I like to call that hangry, right? But that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? That doesn't even give you, get you close to what I talk about when I'm referring to hunger. Hunger is scary. Hunger is a basic human need, and without it, you do some pretty unpredictable things. When you don't eat, you can't think. When you don't eat, you can't function. And when you don't eat, you can't live. So the current status quo is that it's them versus us, as if they need to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. But even that experience that you feel of hunger when you haven't eaten in a long time, just imagine that coupled by the feeling of anxiety of not knowing when you'll ever be able to eat again. And you'll begin to do unrational things. And so you don't tell someone to pick themselves up by their bootstraps who doesn't even have boots in the first place. We have to change the narrative. We've been treating people as if they're transactions. Pounds in and pounds out. Pounds before people. Statistics before people. People are not numbers. People are beings that have feelings that are real, and it is real complex. We've been operating in silos, as if this is my territory, so stay back. I work in food, so let me just focus on the number of people I can feed, regardless of the nutritional value, regardless of if it affects any of their other health elements. Or, I work in education, so I'm only going to focus on the number of children I'm able to push out this door, 
regardless on if they're prepared or if they're ready for another phase in their life. Or, I work in economic development, so I'm going to focus on the number of people that I get jobs for, regardless on the working conditions or if they're living wage. We continue by staying in these silos to perpetuate this narrative, and it's not okay. It's time that we change the narrative, and I invite you to lean in on how to do that. One, we first have to recognize that the issue of hunger is complex. People don't just wake up one day and become hungry. It's a system that has them hungry. In the case of Margot, the single mother who's choosing between her rent and electricity, she lost her job. She went through a period of not being able to access food stamps. She didn't know where the food pantry was. So here she is, just with her children, trying to figure it all out. That's how a lot of people's situations are. We have to look at it from the root cause of it. And what I mean by that is that we have to be willing, as caretakers of the community, to look upstream and to consider what's having these people be hungry. And I look at there being four core pillars to household stability. It's food, health, housing, and employment. If you don't have food, you can't think and function. If you don't have housing, you can't expect someone to show up on the job and give 100%. If you don't have health care, you can't really expect someone to perform at their peak. And if you're not employed, you can't expect to bring in an income and for the rest of your house to be stabilized. So an example of this is this is a picture of household instability. If someone doesn't have housing, and if these were all like spokes on a wheel, if one of those spokes are gone, that car isn't moving. It's disabled. And so that's how we've been treating people in America. As if, why can't you just pick yourself up by your bootstraps? Well, they can't. As organizations and as stewards of the community, we have to start working in concert with one another. As I mentioned, a lot of nonprofits do a great job of operating in silos, and it's not just nonprofits, it's several organizations as well. And in working in concert, what I mean by that is co authoring agendas for the quality of life for our entire community and saying that I work really well in food and this is what I can contribute, or I work really well in health care and this is what I contribute, in housing, in unemployment, in education, and being able in this massive puzzle to put down our puzzle piece and step back and consider how does my piece affect the entire picture. That's what I mean by working in concert. It's not about the lack. It's about looking at the bigger picture and seeing the abundance of opportunity. We then have to be unapologetic about advocating on the public's behalf. It is with us that the public entrusts, as nonprofit leaders, as government officials, to keep the public in mind. I'm not passing any judgment, but I'll tell you what we should do. And in keeping the public in mind, we have to put a stake in the ground. We have to go from feeding the hungry to solving hunger. We have to be willing to put ourselves out of business to ensure that the health of the public is our first priority. And who knows, once we finish solving hunger, we can go from feeding America to nurturing America. How about that? And when we do that, new possibilities arise. Possibilities such as food banks working with school districts to provide pop-up school pantries, where on a monthly basis, schools get provided with food for the families and their students that attend that school to ensure they have a consistent flow of healthy and safe food. Or healthcare providers working with food pantries to provide diabetic-friendly food pantries to ensure that those facing hunger don't also lose their health because they're not eating to live or the farmers markets who start allowing the use of EBT, food stamps, so that all people can enjoy the access 
to healthy and safe food. So it's when we begin to work in concert with one another that anything becomes possible. And so I share my story with you in hopes of changing the narrative. And I never have considered myself a public health professional. You know, I, I've done a lot of things in the community, but I've never had formal training. But what I've come to discover is that by me working and advocating on behalf of the public's health and well-being that, in fact, I was operating in public health. And so you all may be listening to this, and you may be thinking, hmm, that's interesting, right? And so I don't want you to leave here and just fire off a text, hashtag hunger sucks, and then five, <laughs> and then five seconds later lean over to your neighbor and say, where are we eating after this? I want you to lean in just a little bit closer. And I want you to go back to your communities. And one, I want you to realign your personal mission to why you do what you do and make it worth your life. I want you to dig deep and have your why be so big it doesn't matter how you do it or how long it takes. Next, I want you to re-engineer how you do things in your places of operation. By re-engineering, I mean to begin to massage and to reshape how you're operating and to ensure that you're addressing the root cause and that you're doing it as effectively and as nimbly as possible. And finally, I want you to reframe the conversation in every space that you walk into so that hunger is no longer on the table and solving hunger is. So I invite you to join me in this mission to change the narrative because together we can and together we can change the world. Thank you.